The Rebel Capitalist Show. This is just S&P 500 indices. This is energy, and it's decreased by about 30% since 2014. It's gone up a little bit since prices improved. And this is ESG. You know, this is the warm, fuzzy uh, environmental, social, and governance. And, you know, it's gone through the ceiling. And so this is where people are putting their money and people aren't putting their money here because the performance is bad. But this is what drives the economy. And and this is is something else. So, you know, just just kind of and the the yellow is, is the ratio of the two. So it's just gone down, down, down. Now, final point, um, climate change. And I'm not here to pound the table about climate change. I'm here to say that. If you ignore reality as an investor, you're screwed. And I know an awful lot of people in my business and a lot of investors that have just decided based on, you know, no expertise of their own, that all this climate change is a hoax. It's not real. And, you know, climate change all the time. It's natural, blah, 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 blah. So I, I, I read uh, Steve Coonan's book called Unsettled. And this has gotten, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of people have read it. Kunin is a you know, he's a physics professor. He was in the Obama administration. Maybe that's a you know a negative, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but he was an undersecretary of energy. And you know, and he's published this book that you know that a lot of people have read that basically says, Don't worry about it. Well, you know, this is this is Steve Kunin's graph of, of annual Greenland ice law. Okay, so if if temperatures are increasing, we should be losing more ice. And his point is, well, you know, it it, it goes up, it goes down and, and, you know, it went up a lot, but now it's actually going down. And so, you know, the people that say this is due to climate change, they're just, you know, they're just blowing smoke. Well, I got the data and and recreated his graph here in blue. I'm actually showing the the real data. By the way, he does a 10 year average statistically suspect on annual data, but that's another issue. And then I I just said, okay, well, you know, since 1900, which is his graph beginning, how much cumulative ice has been lost? And the answer is 15 trillion cubic meters. All right. You know, we don't need to do a, 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 you know, a a school exercise and how much a cubic meter is. 15 trillion cubic meters is a great big number. You can argue all day and all night about the cycles and how it doesn't matter. All we're telling you is we've lost a ton of ice since 1900, and you just can't make that go away. And then this is his graph of CO2 concentration, which he says, you see, CO2 level is just about at the lowest it's ever been on planet Earth. I mean, this is 600 million years. So he's comparing, you know, what it has been or is to what it was in 1950. So, you know, all this stuff about CO2, it's nonsense. Well, the problem is, is that the scale of his chart, every dot is 40 million years. Okay. When did human beings show up on planet Earth as homo sapiens? 300,000 years ago, all right? So everything that we've done is, you know, consists in a, a, a pinhead of, of, of the final dot above zero. And if you actually say, well, what's happened since the year 2000? Same data, by the way, and compare it to 1950, what you see, I'm sorry, since the year zero, since the birth of Christ, CO2 was, you know, kind of flat. It wasn't really going anywhere. It went up a little bit, you know, in the 13, 14, 1500s, it went down a little bit. Look what it's doing now. 1850, 1900, 1950, 2000. Now, this is the same data. It's just I haven't averaged the data over 40 million years. So, again, you know, I don't want to argue like, what does CO2 mean? And is it a leading indicator? Is it a trailing indicator? Blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying that when you, when you read a book like, like Steve Coonan and you come away saying, oh, it's not a problem, 
you know, you're you're not getting and you're not getting the story. And so whether CO2 matters or not is is another story. But the fact that this graph is just hugely misleading, hugely misleading, it's just not even open to questions. So final slide. What I'd like to have people remember from this, energy is the economy and oil is the master energy resource. Those who do not understand this will consistently miss investment opportunities. Climate change is real, but an energy blind rush into renewables is not the solution. Those who do not acknowledge this, that climate change is real, will also miss many investment opportunities. So it's, you know, it, it's not, it's not philosophical for me. Mm. <laughs> It's just pragmatic. I mean, you know, get real, acknowledge reality, and you'll do better as an investor. Energy transitions are additive. They're not subtractive. There's never been an energy transition where we stop using something. We're using just as much wood today as we used in 1700. It's just as a percentage, it's gone down because now we're using coal and natural gas and oil. We right. didn't stop using wood. Coal use has not gone down. It's gone down as a percentage. People don't understand you don't get off of things. You just don't. We're not going to get off of fossil fuel. It, you know, hopefully it, it, it decreases a, as a percentage. Humans have never gone from a higher to a lower energy density source, which is to say, I mean, oil is by far the most productive energy source we've got. And, and this is the equivalent of suggesting to all the animals out in the savanna of South Africa that they all become vegans. You know, right. we're going to give up meat. It's time to change your diet. It's a good idea for the, this is the, this is the concept of I go to the hospital and I've got some horrible disease and they say, but we've got it. We've got a solution. We're going to try a surgery that's never been done before. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Well, we're trying to do something that's never been done before. So there's risk. What I'd like everybody to bear in mind as they sort through all the, the noise is there just is no clear way forward that includes sustaining current levels of energy use and economic growth and solving our climate. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, George. If you had to just wave a magic wand, if we had to really stick the landing here, I would assume it's something where you have to do you have to do this incrementally, very, very carefully, understanding that there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And am I am I kind of going down the right path? And I'm sure you've given this a lot of thought. So, I mean, how would you stick the landing? Before we before I try to answer your question, I'm, I got to say, this is really risky. Any way we do it is going to be risky. Okay. Um, so what can we do? First of all, when you hear anybody say that they, oh, you know, there's some great new technology that's going to fix this, um, you know, uh, turn off that channel. Um, that, that's BS. OK, I mean, whatever that guy is talking about is not real today. Uh, by the time it, you know, it, 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 it passes its pilot test and gets upscaled and gets commercialized and gets adopted. I mean, we're talking about, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. So anybody who, who, who thinks the technology is going to save us, I think, needs to get a new life. OK. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I love technology. I wouldn't be a scientist if I didn't. But it's not going to save us. We got it. We got to deal with what we got. Okay. So is so, the answer consumption? Lowering consumption? I mean, that's a that's a bad path too. Yeah, that's like trying to convince lions to go on a diet. Um, but you're going to kill a lot of not, lions that way. Well, they they just don't understand what you're talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, they go out and kill an impala and, and you're gonna say, Oh, wait a minute, you know, why don't you save some of the impala? You know, only eat a third of the impala. And he's gonna say, wait a minute, if I don't eat this, then some hyena's gonna get it. I mean, I gotta eat it because I killed it. 
Um, so what we can do is natural gas is a whole lot better, a whole lot cleaner than coal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's arguments all over the map, you know, that, well, we got a lot of methane leakage from coal and blah, blah, blah. But bottom line, it's a lot cleaner. So we need to stop using coal as much as we can and start using natural gas as much as we can. To your point, poor countries are going to have a much harder time doing this, okay? But, I mean, I just drove up and back from Austin this weekend to visit my grandchildren and my oldest son and daughter-in-law. You know, I passed two gigantic belching coal plants along the way, all right? You know, I mean, the counties I drove through in Texas are not poor counties. Um, the United States can afford to make an aggressive transition from coal to natural gas. Uh, Botswana, not so much. Um, but so, so that's, that, that's one thing we can do. We also need to stop uh, following false flags, okay? I mean, the idea that we're gonna make a difference at all by all driving electric vehicles is total nonsense. It's pure marketing, okay? That, that, that we're only talking about, you know, like 15% of emissions come from internal combustion engine cars. Now, transportation overall is huge because we're talking shipping and trains and trucks and all of that. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, 15% is 15%. I mean, it's a whole lot better than 0%. I'm just trying to say that it's, you know, it's a little bitty part of a much bigger problem. You know, uh, you know, stop using plastic straws. I mean, okay, fine, do it if it makes you feel better, but don't think you're making a difference in the world. I mean, we got, we've got to start, we got to attack the big stuff if, if we want to make a difference. And you're right, George, consumption is the key. That the, the only way that we're going to substantially reduce emissions is by using less. And yes, we can use it cleaner, better, more efficiently, et cetera, et cetera. Insulate buildings. That's the number one thing we can do. We waste so much damn energy with our poorly insulated commercial buildings. Okay. But none of this is going to happen very quickly. The other thing I'd love for people to understand is that electric power, I mean, we talk about renewables, we talk about nuclear, we talk about that isn't good for anything except electric power. And don't get me wrong. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking to each other thanks to electric power. It's important, but it's only a small piece. I mean, the truth is that if you take electric power and subtract all the energy losses, and they're huge from generation, transmission, and distribution, electric power only accounts for 20% of the energy used in the world. So you can go to 100% renewable tomorrow if somehow we could figure out how to do that, and you've only solved 20% of the problem. So this is what human beings do. You know, we've all taken classes, you know, from Covey or, you know, Wharton or whatever that, that says, well, you know, you, you need to prioritize what's important. You do your A's, your B's, and your C's, and typically what we do is we take care of the C's because they're easier to handle. And we get all done with taking care of the little stuff. And we feel so much better, except that the A's and the B's, the big stuff still haven't been approached. And so what I'm trying to say is that by driving electric cars and by, you know, not using plastic straws and things like that, we're solving our C problems, which doesn't mean they don't need to be solved. It's just they're not the big stuff that matters. Yeah. So. If, if you want continued economic growth, um, I can't tell you how we're going to solve that. Yes, and, and to your point also about people, George, this is really important. If you take all the, the non-fossil energy that we have in the world today, it can only support about 3 billion people. Yeah. We got eight in the world. If you get really aggressive and say, well, maybe we can double it. You know, maybe we can get it to, you know, maybe we could double that. That means that we got 3 billion people that need to die. Okay. And we're talking about 2050 and the population projections for 2050, about 10 billion. 
So what we're talking about here isn't, it, it's not theological, it's not philosophical. We're talking about, you know, real people's living or dying. And, and we simply do not have, we cannot get there from here with renewable energy. And I'm all for it. I'm 100% for renewable energy. I'm just being honest. We cannot support the population we have on renewable energy. We don't know how to do it. I mean, this goes into like World Economic Forum stuff, because then what you're talking about is either reducing consumption or reducing the population. Uh, or both. Yeah. 